Dignified Resilience. Um, I'm so honored and privileged uh, to speak with our today's guest. Ida Murad is an entrepreneur coach focused on founder well-being, an artist and a passionate connector. She has worked over a decade building social enterprises in the United States and in the Middle East and North African region um, in education, fashion, food, health and technology industries. Her involvement with creative industries is also geared towards creating social change. In the past, she has organized festivals within the United States to celebrate refugees' talents in creativity. Um, previously, Ida co-founded a sustainable fashion company. She managed over $300 million in philanthropic and development funds for public and private sectors, as well as designed youth and entrepreneurship programs globally. Uh, she's a recipient of numerous awards for women leadership, for her art, and she appears regularly on numerous global TV networks um, speaking on the power of will in adversity. Today, she also spends time advising social enterprises and foundations, serving as co-director of Nexus, which is a community that brings together impact investors, philanthropists, and social entrepreneurs to tackle global problems. But she's also very involved with um, initiatives that deal with mental health crisis, bringing um, impact investors and the social entrepreneurs together, while also creating uh, impactful art and writing for Thrive Global. She will tell us more about herself, um, but how did it all come to, to, to be today? Um, in 2010, Ida, at her last year of university, was also diagnosed with an autoimmune type of arthritis. Um, and she, is, she has been very open uh, about all sorts of tough um, and joyous thoughts and stages in the past few years that she's gone through. And Ida also radiates beautiful energy and warmth. We talked about this on the record a little bit, which made me feel so at ease from the very first moment that we uh, connected online. And she makes, she made me, and I feel that that's the case, just feel at ease and safe in her presence. So I'm so happy to have her here today at Dignified Resilience and to talk about all sorts of professional and personal endeavors that she's been so dedicated to as she keeps on um, helping people, like she says, unlock human potential. God, Ida, there's so much to talk about. How about we start from the very beginning, which is welcome to Dignified Resilience. And uh, you are in New York City right now. Am I, am I correct? How's everything? Yes, first, thank you for having me. I feel like my heart is bursting. And I hope that you receive my hug and whoever's listening also receives my hug because you know, at the end of the day, we all just want love. So I'm, sent, I'm gonna start this with love, uh, but I'm in New York. Okay. In LA very soon, in two days actually. <laughs> wow, wow, that's, that's, that's a big change. Um, so Ida, I think it would be great if we start with your personal story so our listeners learn from yourself um, as you say, and as I learned from you, you're wise. Um, what, well, I said a little bit, but you can tell us more. Um, you share so openly about all kinds of changes in states that, um, that arthritis diagnosis at young age took you to. Would you share, um, as you do so graciously, um, a little bit about that journey and how it has been different and where it had taken you? Yeah, I'll start with saying I don't believe in boxes. And I think life really tries to put us in boxes in order to understand the other. And the reality, and this is a very big clarification I've just gotten during COVID, is that I'm nothing, but I'm everything at the same time. So it's for most of my life, I've tried to understand and been so frustrated with how I just couldn't fit into one box. So my why in, in my being is just to be love and to spread love. And, and you said it at the start is to unlock human potential. And that starts with giving myself permission to do so. So I grew up in Jordan, uh, Palestinian background, and 
I started working since I was 13 and I love business. Love it, love it, love it. Um, but I, and I ended up working very hard in, in college and studying very hard. And I really found my self-worth through work and through getting those great, like those check marks of A plus, et cetera. But then I ended up burning out, burning myself out because again, my self-worth was really in work and I didn't give myself any break. So I ended up being semi-paralyzed and I had to drop out of I had to college um, and change my major from Bachelor of Science to Bachelor of Arts because I couldn't attend classes anymore. And that was my first like, wake up call to life and to really question everything. And I reached really dark places to the point where I contemplated um, it's my life. I just uh, it, literally of whether it's worth me living or not. And since then, I've reinvented myself in so many ways. And I've just now reached the point where I'm letting go of defining who I am. So I've been, in, a, a, in essence, I've been an entrepreneur and I've worked with government. I've worked with private sector. I've worked in a bank, which I rarely talk about. Uh, I've worked in different sectors. I've been someone in love i've been someone heartbroken i've been an artist who's self-taught and i just kind of now live in deep listening and surrender and try to serve so that's kind of who i am i would say thank you for sharing that um i do want considering this imminent reality and global pandemic it feels like um this is an opportunity that we should again remind our listeners how many people specifically with because we tend to forget um, that people with pre-existing conditions or impaired immune systems are much more vulnerable from COVID-19 and I want to share and use this opportunity to also remind listeners about how we should all be responsible and mindful also of other people's health while trying to protect uh, ourselves as well. So I do want to, and I wanted to ask you, how has the pandemic or has it impacted uh, your health in some new ways? Oh my goodness, yes. And emotionally in unbelievable ways. And I truly believe this, this, this pandemic, you know, one, we have to call out privilege. I'm privileged enough to have a safe home, to have food and to be able to move around. So I'll start with that. But then second, I, you know, we're, we're, life programs us to be so busy in order to avoid our own trauma and to avoid, like, it's easy to find distractions. So with COVID, I live alone. So I couldn't run anymore. And I broke down. You know how a skin, a, a snake sheds skin and, re, and, and gets this new skin, but the process I don't know, uh, but I would anticipate is painful. For me, it was incredibly painful on many fronts. One is health-wise, if I contracted COVID, I would, my, my level of increased potential for death is much higher because of my autoimmune disease. And my doctor told me, you'll have a 70% chance of passing away. So just hearing that news you know, I've been, I've, I was terrifying and I've been faced with my, my mortality very often since a young age, but that was very hard to hear again. It's never, never gets easy, I would say for me. But then second is I, I faced all my traumas. Like I, I could hear all my, my nightmares were coming up. My things that happened when I was five would come up. The heartbreak that I had five years ago came up. And I dealt with it and I tried really hard actually to keep myself busy with work and go back to my old lifestyle, but at home. And I called myself one day where after having maybe two weeks of nonstop calls for 15 hours a day. And I said, Aida, what are you doing? Like, what's the point of this pandemic? If you are not going to leave this house changed. So I gave myself, but I really felt guilty. To, do, to give myself permission to, to turn off work and just focus on my inner trauma. 
But I realized like once this COVID pandemic ends, I'm going to have to step up as a leader in different ways and serve in better ways. So that was the second thing. The third thing was I lost all my clients in April. And I was, I, I was pretty set, you know, in March and I was set for, for about a year and a half uh, or about a year. Um, and I didn't expect that. I didn't, I didn't expect my clients because they said they'll stay, uh, but they didn't. And I've been through worse before. So after going through those, those sad emotions and real deep sense of shame, because I, I questioned myself if I was a failure and I looked past the illusion because again, I've been through worse before and I said, okay, God, my faith plays an instrumental role in my life. So I asked oh, God, what is the purpose? Like, why is this happening? Help me see. So I did a lot of deep listening and that's where I got clarity of I need to pivot fully into mental health because I'm a systems girl and I'm a connector and a convener and I bring people together in a very strategic way. So looking at the mental health crisis, which is ever happening now, everyone is impacted by mental health. This could be an opportunity. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so it was kind of a blessing in disguise for me. Yeah, it's um, important that you mentioned now we're at the end of May and May's Mental Health Awareness Month. Yeah. Um, this year, more than ever, it's important, I think, to talk openly about mental health and take care of our mental well-being. Um, and just to uh, remind our listeners who might not be aware, the coronavirus pandemic has made this mental crisis, mental health crisis in America even worse. And one telling piece of data is that from February 16 to March 15 this year, the number of antidepressant prescriptions filled in the U.S. rose by 18.6%. So, and probably it's gone up uh, even more since then. And, and there are many articles describing now how doctors are having very difficult time determining who needs urgent intervention, who is simply, what is the new normal? Are we all getting, you know, in a way more or less clinically depressed? So I, in that, that said, uh, and knowing your professional efforts, I was wondering, would you be willing to tell us more about the Never Alone Summit uh, that you were involved with? Or, um, because I know that one of your missions which I've learned is also, and you said it, to create the systems change for people who are experiencing mental health. So what, what do you mean exactly by, by, by that? So one, I'll start with mental health. Everyone is impacted by mental health. Uh, one person that I actually interviewed during the Never Alone Summit, uh, he said that we all have bodies and we all need to take care of the health of our bodies. And we all have a mental health, which is it's either well or it's not. So there is no such thing as some people are impacted or some people are not. I just want to start with that. But two, mental health is a spectrum. Some people have more extreme uh, impacts, such as being bipolar, such as severe depression, etc. But mental health is a, is a whole system. Why? Because, for example, if someone, if you think of the root causes of mental health, there's a nutrition component. There's an economic component. So if one is not feeling safe and stable financially, that causes anxiety and stress and then depression. And then you see even in the founders, so I've in my past kind of chapter and I'm still carrying that on, I work a lot with founders in early stage startups. And 50%, if I recall correctly, the statistics, 50% of founders have higher risk rates around suicide. And that's not an okay statistic. So mental health is linked to every single sector in every single way of being. Again, nutrition to physical health, to economic health, all of it. Mm -hmm. uh, so what I'm doing right now is trying to figure out, it's quite complex. Um, how can we approach it on, a systematic level making sure each key stakeholder knows its role and that they're speaking together because what i've found is people are very siloed mm -hmm. and haven't really been incentives to cooperate so i'm trying to crack that puzzle <laughs> yeah and through your work 
and through her presence as well, you always also help voice the necessity of working together to end the devastating stigma surrounding the mental health crisis. Um, and recently there's been a plethora of articles in the media claiming that the next uh, pandemic crisis is mental health. But what should we do to approach this from exactly um, a place of, um, you know, working together against the stigma? And I know that recently you posted uh, your support for Mental Health Coalition with the How Are You Really Challenge? So you could tell us more about it, but I would like that you share something that I appreciated so much from your own um, th th thoughts in terms of this great thing that you wrote, uh, you choose to ask people, how is your heart rather than how are you? Which I thought was so great, but um, so what, what, what's going on with the, with the stigma and what uh, are you working on? So first and most importantly is even if you choose not to speak up about it, but there's a role and importance to it and it's not for everyone. And we'll start with that, that is speaking up with your own self is taking the time to process the things that have happened in your life. And everyone has experiences from young age till now that's shaped them. And you'd be so surprised, like some of the founders I work with, something that happened to them at age five, they keep that narrative with them, but they're not conscious of it. So my process is around unlearning. First thing you have to be aware, but we wanna unlearn certain things. And then we want to learn a new way of being. And then it's dreaming and then it's building. So you can take that on a business level or personal level. So I'll start with just creating safe spaces within your own self is so critical. And then creating safe spaces with your loved ones. And if you think of it as a circle, like this is first you and then your loved ones and then your community and then some familiar strangers and then the rest of the world. But I don't believe in, sh in just breaking the stigma when you're, and speaking up when you're not ready because there, there are relapses. If I spoke up, or, and there's some things I'm not ready to speak about. And when I'm ready, I will. Because my, my why is service. And I, my why is to make sure that people aren't impacted. Um, or that we can support some people and help prevent some things. But um, I kind of lost my train of thought there because yeah. see, this is what happens is what's interesting is what happened just to show you a case is I thought about the things that I don't want to share mm -hmm. because I have not yet processed them. So I took five seconds to think about that. And I'm like, oh, this is not a place I want to be in. And then I'm like, oh, wait, I'm here. You know, so this is just a classic example. Um, so I'll stop there. And just say, stigma for, breaking stigma first has to start with the self and then help others. And that's, do you still go on with the how is your heart rather than how are you? Oh my goodness, yes. So for me, how is your heart? You know, when we ask how are you, it's very formal. And it, we're not really asking, at least in America, for me, it's... Uh, maybe less so in Jordan, uh, but I found it very prominent here, is we're not really curious. We're busy. It's cool to be busy. And that's how we get our self-worth, which makes no sense. So I remember a previous um, man who was very special to me told me that Aida, your heart is the orchestra of your life. Like he runs, he or she runs your life. So he's like, how is your heart? And I was so taken aback by that question because like, he saw me. Because if my heart is not good, then really everything else isn't good. I'm not thinking too well. That's why when someone faces a broken heart from love, everything just seems harder. So for me, I always lead with how's your heart? And it's been so interesting to see the different responses. Some people are so taken aback and they're like, okay, I need to leave. And that just says that they're not ready to talk about their heart. There's some work to do. And the beautiful thing I'll say about that last thing is 
it changes moment by moment. And that's part of our work is to be in the moment. Like if you ask me now, how's my heart? I'll tell you, I'm really excited and honored to be here and just full. Maybe in two seconds, I'll be different. I don't know. I feel like we could make a whole episode just about this because I think there's so much cultural impacts and cultural things that, that would need to change in order to be speaking uh, about it with vulnerability without uh, being afraid. And I know that you also appreciate um, Brene Brown, right, who speaks about vulnerability as, as power. So lots yeah. of work we need to do towards that direction in business as well in terms of uh, founders and others who you work with. But because mm -hmm. there is so much uncertainty out there right now and many people are actually experiencing this sort of um, huge uncertainty for the first time. Um, there are a lot of there are there are a lot of psychologists who offer different uh, practices and resources uh, and things one could do to um, keep going in kind of positive and constructive way through these um, times. And of course, not everyone is affected equally within uh, geo within even same geography because of class, um, race, uh, etc. But um, and all of those impact changes that pandemic brought to, brought to our lives. Right. I would appreciate in that sense if you could share your thoughts uh, about something that you've read that thanks to your experiences you wrote that finding contentment in the adversities of life is, you wrote many would say build resilience, but my answer beyond that is foster contentment, which is the best, right. most sustainable kind of resilience. So I, could you expand a little bit about that? Um, yeah. yeah. It's so, fa humans, we're so fascinating because I was just talking about this earlier today of, you know, we work so hard to get to a goal. And once we reach that goal, how long does that satisfaction last? Mm -hmm. Not that long, mm -hmm. you know? So, and, and when you think of the journey, the typical journey is we're so stressed, 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 stressed because we just want to get here. And then when we get here, yay. And then we're like, stress, 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 because we want to go there. And that's ridiculous. Like, we really, if aliens were looking at us, <laughs> I'd be like, how have these people structured their lives? So for me, I realized I just have to be content with whatever I have. And I credit that piece of contentment to my healing. Because I remember when I could not move my whole body and I could only move one finger. I remember that night very clearly. And I was like, wow, I have a choice mm -hmm. to see the beauty and the magic and feel so full in just being able to move this finger. Or I could be like, oh my God, this is shit and this sucks and what am I going to do? And I decided, you know what? I can't change maybe the circumstances. Who knows? Who knows? Maybe I'll stay paralyzed for the rest of my life. But what I do know is in my control is how I feel in this moment. Mm -hmm. And that's where contentment comes in. Because if we're putting a but and a maybe and an and or anything conditional to our contentment then i it will go away so i've lost a lot and i'm grateful for this loss in my life because it taught me that it's all here and now that i want to live in abundance i want to live a full life i'm actually giving myself permission for that because i know it won't change my core i'll still be happy but now i want to live it with ease <laughs> I know you used to carry the word radia, meaning content in Arabic around your neck, but do you, do you still wear it? Or how do you remind yourself of your own power and resilience in these days? Yeah, I'm actually wearing it um, here. Uh, it's, it's, uh, we as humans, I, I would say we're creatures of habit. Mm -hmm. And uh, I used to be really harsh on myself for not being so grateful all the time and for forgetting. And I'm like, Aida, you've been through such extreme things. Why are you taking your health for granted? I remember this story. Oh my, I, I <laughs> just to show you how funny, again, our forgetfulness is. 
So right now I had, I was semi-paralyzed for about four and a half years of my life. So that's a lot of time and a lot of um, pain. And all I wanted to do was go to the gym and just move my body. Cause I used to be very athletic. So fast forward, um, I go, I'm going to the gym and I'm super stressed because this is my first time going to the gym. I'm super stressed because I have six job offers around and each one in a different country. And I'm trying to think, which one should I take? Which one's the right decision? And I remember, and I'm like going and I'm just, you know, as if I was a machine and I go on the, the, the I forgot, I think it was, oh, it was the treadmill. And it hit me. I'm like, oh my God, I just got exactly what I wanted. And I'm not even grateful grateful for it and I'm not even aware I don't even remember me walking into the gym because I was so in my head worried about the six job offers that I have you know so this is where I have to go back to that word and not be harsh on myself for forgetting sometimes because that'll be just not part of life and just be like okay Aida breathe breathe choose choose a different way and that's how I do it. It's just being aware and being kind to myself and developing a new habit. Yeah, yeah that's that forgiving to ourselves, but also consciously investing into um, self-introspection, I think it's, um, it's a huge success for those who can even get to that point of being able to think about their own actions. And like you say, creating these new patterns and power of our mm -hmm. own thoughts and realizing that. Um, so, um, so your words about forgetfulness also made me think about relationship we have with ourselves. Um, it, you have, um, in 2018, you traveled for 260 days and you wrote about that time in different countries from Indonesia to Tunisia to Morocco, um, how we can run from many things, but when forced to be alone, especially in foreign countries, you cannot run away from yourself. And I thought it was just, it, it was, it was great and it could resonate in different contexts as well. How you say, I decided to face my deepest fears and find a way to free myself of them. Could we all do that? Like, how do we do that? How did that, why is that more important? I feel it's more important today than ever in terms of that relationship with ourselves and being comfortable even in the discomfort of loneliness for many people and facing that inner yeah you know the inner world is so beautiful what but but it takes courage to go in there right because again we we are great at distracting ourselves and placing success in things that are good but then not not whole mm -hmm. so if we think about what makes a successful life most people would say from who i've asked oh getting that job securing that million whatever selling my company some would say falling in love and getting married and having children but really rarely does one say being comfortable with my own skin and giving myself permission to live a joyous life. So like, right, that was, that was, I think, I forgot which year actually, 2018. And I traveled more, I, cal I recalculated it and it was more, but um, what's funny, and this just shows the work is constant. I faced so much of my trauma then. And now in quarantine, I faced a whole new bunch of traumas, as well as things that were in the past that I wasn't ready to address. And I could, you know, I used to think I was broken and was so scared that people would see me as broken because there's so much to work on. And I think I'm finally comfortable with my skin how did that happen is because I gave up the illusion of what I can control. Mm. I couldn't, if I can leave 
whoever is listening with a single message is look at your relationship with surrender and control. Really, just take a moment to look at it and see where your stress is coming from. And really, it's by one trying to control things that are out of their hands. And the moment I saw that, and I kind of just released it, things just got simpler. And, and that's where faith comes in for me and really is important. Um, because I just know that there's something beyond me also supporting me. I don't have to have all this weight on my shoulders alone. Yeah, I, that resonates so much with me. I'm, um, faith is really important in my life too and um, provides such a huge basis of everything in terms of finding balance and inspiration and guidance for tough times um, and joyous ones as well. So I hear you there. Um, and but what we while we need to find a balance within ourselves we also need the community um and uh, there is now quote unquote loneliness epidemic in the united states as coined by uh, vivek murthy who was the 19th surgeon general uh, and who wrote a book recently published together the healing power of human connection in sometimes lonely world and i think the book got um quite a lot of attention precisely because of the circumstances that we're all in right now. But I, what I thought was very interesting, and he wrote it recently, he said, as the pandemic continues, it becomes clear that social distancing is a misnomer. What we actually must practice is you know, physical distancing to, spread the, to, to stop the spread of COVID-19. But socially, uh, we need to be a kind of connected with friends and family. So I was wondering if you could elaborate um, about the meaning of community to, to you in all its various um, manifestations, considering your own diverse background and then variety of places that are part of your identity, but also the different communities that, that you have built or created or become part of um, all along. Yeah, thank you for raising that because you know the, we don't live in a world of isolation. We just don't. And when we go to the simplest of times, the Bedouins, they were really tribes. And I was just thinking, I was talking to a friend about why are marriages failing today in general? Um, and one thing she pointed out is, you know, before they had community, the woman had her network of women and the man didn't fulfill all and the woman didn't fulfill all. They had their specific roles. Not saying that time was fully right, but there's something to learn from it. And for me, I'm a community builder and I know what it means to be alone. So I'm very, very committed and thirsty also for community. So last year, for example, I organized 200 dinners at my home where I cooked for people and I had them in this very home, strangers and familiar faces. And the way I, I the condition was, we're going to talk about our hearts. So it's going to be food and vulnerability. And why? Because I don't really care where you work. I don't really care what you do. I don't care which background you're from. And it was very important for me for it to be intergenerational because I don't think we have enough intergenerational things. So I've had the youngest from 11 to I believe 85 years old. And I think what makes a community is the sense of belonging and how do you feel like you belong to someone is by connecting to their heart some people will categorize it as values some people will see it as you know similar cultural things which plays a role like i know some arabs i feel automatically much more comfortable with it's just my subconscious kind of bias but really it's for me it's how vulnerable can you be and open? And do I feel like I belong with you? Do I feel safe? And I think that question also for whoever is listening is noticing where do you feel safe? And you don't have to show all of you and, and put all your eggs in this one basket because 
You're a multifaceted human being. Every single person is. We've just been conditioned to put ourselves in boxes going to the start of our conversation. So for me, also in building community, diversity is so important because I never want to be in just one bubble. I'll stop there. And throughout all these years, let's not forget the role of art in your life how much art has helped you heal and the beautiful painting behind, you know, there are no bookshelves. There's just, it's just this gorgeous painting that Ida has behind her, which is her own creation. Could we talk about the place of art in your life and how much creativity, and we know also from numerous studies that regardless of skill and ability, people are able to even strengthen mental health by participating in any activity that allows them to nourish or develop that creativity. How has art helped you, help you? And tell us more, um, tell, tell people yeah. see, the, you know, you paint with your hands and I've yeah. seen go online, idamorad.com, the gorgeousness lies there, people, and it's being created constantly. So um, tell us more. Thank you. And I'm just feeling the smile on my face when you talk about art. It's truly a passion, a deep love of mine. So I fell into art, so baby, I'll start actually from baby Aida. I used to always uh, look at paintings in my grandparents' house and just like stand mesmerized. Really, for hours, I'll just look. And then I remember from society, it was told that art is a hobby. It's something cute you keep at home. So quickly, me being want, like wanting to be the best and wanting to be successful on paper, I'm like, what is the most you know, successful thing? And I found being an economist, you know, as a woman mm -hmm. would be the best thing. So I did that and I completely disregarded art. So I had no art until four years ago or five years ago, maybe. And the way I turned to it, it was really out of necessity because when I had my second episode of paralysis, I was facing a couple of problems or issues. One, I was heartbroken because I was in love with a Christian and I'm Muslim and we wanted to get married. We couldn't get married. It's so a Romeo and Juliet story. And, and I was just heartbroken because I really couldn't talk about it with anyone because that's a fa like you keep it hush hush, which I really disagree with. Like it's, it's heartbreak is heartbreak. And then second, is uh, doctors told me I likely never use my hands again because of my autoimmune. So I'm like, shoot, like now I lost from what the experts say, something that I use so often. And third, because I left Jordan at the time and I just came to the US, I didn't have a job. And so imagine I was trying and people, I remember I was being interviewed by people and people asking me, why you? What's special about you? And honestly, I couldn't answer that question. I was like, I don't know. I really didn't know. So I remember just that day when the doctors told me I can't use my, I likely not use my hands again. I looked at my hands and I was, I, I really wondered what is the point of life? And something whispered to me saying, Aida, I talked about this at the Never Alone Summit, but, um, said, look at your fingerprints. Like no one has your fingerprint. And it was something so simple that I was like, oh my God, there must be something I have to offer. I just don't know what it is. So I started painting with my fingers as a way to process the question of what's special about me. And then also to kind of show that I can still use my hands. And then somehow it turned into, you know, 11 exhibitions. And it's been a magical, magical experience of really facing me being, being comfortable with my own skin and also processing emotions in a safe space. So now, if you asked me a couple of years ago, Aida, would you be okay with someone not liking your art or not liking you, essentially, because that's a big part of me. I would have been, my heart would have skipped a beat. I'd be like, I don't know if I can handle that. Mm -hmm. But what art taught me was you can't please everyone. 
And I was such a people pleaser. Oh my goodness. I just wanted everyone to be happy, which meant I sacrificed so much of my authenticity in me. So with art, I no longer think of what the other will like. I'm really like, what is coming out for me? And I will please, not even please, but I will speak to the right people. So I encourage every single person, no matter your profession, to pick up some form of art because it allows you to get out of your box. And last thing I'll say about art is it feeds my business. Meaning whenever I, when I, especially when I used to build strategies for, for companies, I would get a lot of my information and inspiration through art and vice versa. Like it was just, they feed each other. So I recommend it. Yeah, and I think that I read recently that art classes are required in med schools as well, which I thought was great because uh, of the benefits that, that we talked about recently. Um, this takes me to part of our conversation, which I call five sweet questions, in which I um, ask things that would allow listeners to get to know a little bit more, um, in, but that would get to know you a little bit better. Uh, and closer uh, rather than behind and beyond just professional uh, endeavors and great things that you do in that in that way. So first question would be, once this current global pandemic emergency is over, even though I don't know how will that be declared one day, but um, in terms of when you feel that you are at a point where it feels like, okay, this is the end of that phase, is there any thing that you would not want to forget from this period? We, uh, surrender is just my, my relationship with surrender and also deep listening. Like I really, I picked up meditation during this time. So I would say meditation because that's where I foster surrender and that's where I foster deep listening. Yeah. Um, Absolutely. And, and we know the benefits of um, compassionate meditation and love and kindness meditation, particularly. So I urge people to whatever their spiritual channel is, religion or not, to uh, seek more spiritual grounding and solidification because benefits really are there and proven. Um, second question, Ida, which of your personality traits has been the most useful? Not the best trait, but the most useful. I would say my heart or love. Like I really, when I say I love, I really do love and I think people do feel it. And it's the deepest honor when someone does feel it. And people, so yeah, I, I would say that one. Um, May I ask what's your horoscope sign? Yeah, I'm uh, born September 22nd. So I'm a guest on the cusp of Virgo and something else but i think i'm a virgo i was gonna say are you pisces maybe because uh, i'm pisces and we are kind of feeling those those similar vibes of heart and art and sharing even too much yeah, but, but um the third question what i just want to add like you know sharing and art is so important to me but there's also equally that business yeah and that's what my purpose around founder well-being is all about is how do we reframe what it means to be an entrepreneur? I'm a businesswoman at the end of the day. I love business, but I want to do it in a healthy way. You know? Absolutely. Kudos to all the businesswomen out there who do mindful uh, business. Um, and so that leads me to, I know you're also very busy and you're about to move out to LA, but if you had 30 minutes of free time, like you had it to control it under your control, how do you pass your free time? Oh my God, I really miss going to restaurants. I miss, I used to review restaurants in, in one of my past lives. And like when I used to live in DC and um, we used to own restaurants as well in Jordan. And I just miss receiving food. So yeah, I would love that. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I don't know what's going to happen with the restaurant culture, but I think hopefully eventually sooner or later uh, we'll get to be able to go. I, I've seen some photos of, you know, places and restaurants from um, Asia with plastic kind of barriers between each other. And I was just, oh God, hope that 
you know, even if restaurants don't open for now, I would take my 30 minutes and even having someone just cook for me or I cook for someone that sharing just through food for me is, is divine. Divine. So fourth question, uh, what skill or craft would you like to master? Oh, um, <laughs> I don't know. I know. Such... Oh my God. <laughs> um, honestly, of, of deepening connections. And I feel like in my, I really love my coaching work. I, I would really love to master that more. Mm-hmm. Great. Um, yeah. yeah. Tell me unlocking people's potential and you know if I work with someone who's shaping a new company whether large scale or small if I can serve them better through coaching I'd love that Mm -hmm. I'll be on the lookout and I'll follow you and to to see what's what's up with that in the future Um, the fifth question kind of related it's 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 about friendships uh new or old it's um are you any of your friends completely opposite to you or are most of them similar to you it's a diverse group and you know i would say mostly similar in one one trait at the new especially my new my community today is they're all all impact focused i I forget sometimes that there are jobs out there that don't have an impact element because I'm so in that world of whether they're an impact investor, whether they're a social entrepreneur or a philanthropist, but really the social entrepreneur component, because I don't know how to do work without impact. I just, it's not part of my thinking or DNA. So I think it would be hard for me to be really close with someone who doesn't think with impact in mind. Okay, well, um, that I think brings us towards the end of our conversation. It passed by so quickly and I don't want it to end, but we have another call coming up in like three minutes for Ida. So is there anything that you would like to share with our listeners at the end um, in terms of empowering words or something that you've learned and and that you know in terms of coping with the pandemic or tough times in all various manifestations that people experience differently um within the concepts and frameworks of course of this dignified resilience or contentment as you say or growth would you what would you is there anything you would want to share at the end yeah just i'll start yeah i say Give yourself safe spaces to to be mad, to be sad, to be happy, to be dark, to be just hold space for yourself and don't judge yourself when that comes up. Just observe it and let it breathe. You know, I do this exercise of talking to fear, my own fear. And that has been so transformative because fear really just loves you and wants to protect you. And especially during times of, of like crises, it's, we get into survival mode. So I would just encourage holding space for your fear and reassure it and breathe. And maybe you need to cry. Maybe you need to be mad, just, but let it breathe because after the breathing comes calm, always. That's what I would say. That's beautiful. Um, yeah. And on that note, um guys and everybody listeners go online idamurat.com discover the the beauty of her work and of her really really multifaceted efforts in in various areas of creating good energy and a positive impact uh so that's also feel free to invite your friends online to um subscribe to rate us and stay tuned for more guests from all over the globe As I say at the end, um, stay well and hold tight to those you love. So, see you soon.